Welcome to, the, to this year's summit, um, which used to be a user group meeting. I'm going to use about 20 minutes or 25 minutes of your time to talk a bit about what, we are, what we've been doing in the last years, what we're planning for you in the next two, two, two and a half days, um, and just maybe speculate a bit where this advanced analytics area is going to go over in the next year or two. Um, before I do that, maybe it's worth mention, talking a tiny bit about the new name of this thing. Why did we um, rename our user group meeting and turn it into a, a much larger, actually, if you look around, much larger summit? Um, that really has a couple of reasons. One reason was that user group meeting seemed to be and obviously was increasingly inaccurately describing what this was really all about. When we started this about nine years ago, it really was a user group meeting. There were 12 people coming, they had known Nime before, they used Nime before, they came to Constance, we gathered, we talked about what we were doing with Nime and what we were planning on doing. Now we, and then two, three years ago, people started calling us up and saying, well, I, I'd really like to learn more about Nime, but I'm not a Nime user yet, can I come? And we said, absolutely, right? I mean, that's the idea why, why people are here. So we thought that maybe user group meeting is not a good name, so we were looking around a bit. We didn't want to do the usual big, bold stuff where we called it the Nime World or Nime Wisdom or some other pretentious thing like that. So we decided after a bit of gathering around and searching that Summit actually describes this well. It's something where we meet, it's sort of a highlight once or maybe also a twice a year where users meet, people want to learn more about Nime Meet, it's a friendly gathering, it's about constructive criticism, exchange, and just cool discussions with people that we like. So that's why we renamed it into Summit. The reason why it's called a Spring Summit is that, as I announced last year, we're planning on doing this twice now, so there's going to be a Spring Summit on this side of the globe, and there's going to be a Fall Summit, and we're still looking and nailing down a location, but it's very likely going to be in the Bay Area in September of this year. So we can also, some of our West Coast friends, or maybe even friends from Asia, have a bit of an easier time to get to the West Coast. Good. Attendance. Um, this year we sort of were looking at the numbers and trying to figure out, I mean, all of these organize, I don't care, right? I don't care how many people come, there's a large crowd, fantastic. But then there are all these people like Thomas and Heather and Tobias worrying about catering and how much coffee do we need. So they wanted a prediction, how many people are going to come? So we looked at the past year's attendance, this is true data, that's why it's such a beautiful plot. And last year we were sort of around at 150, we kind of claimed 170, but that really counted everybody, right? We were counting the Nimers, I registered my wife, Rosaya registered her husband. So there are tons of extra people. And so it's really true, true numbers, about 150. So we ran sophisticated analytics, predictive analytics, we have tools for that, and came up with something like this. <laughs> and essentially said, you know what, you're shooting for 200. 200 is a good goal, getting 200 real registrations should be cool. So we were following this, we were comparing registration rates going up over the years, and at some point in time, we hit 200. And the number 200 was actually Luigi de Domenico, where is he? You earned yourself a t-shirt. You were registration number 200. <laughs> when did you register? About a month ago? Something like that. That's the moment when some people here got really scared. And they said, wow. So I don't know if you noticed the ones who were here last year, the tables are a bit narrower, and the rows are going out a bit further to the back. So where we are now is we got 245 real registrations. Welcome, all of you. And the 27, those, we would add those, then those are all Nimers. We'd be at 271. Pretty cool. Very impressive. Welcome to all of you to this year's summit. Um, where is everybody coming from? I mean, this does mean it's a bit cramped. Um, we already talked to the catering people for lunch. We're going to have four lines instead of two lines. We have extra coffee machines. There's all sorts of little logistic nightmares that I don't really worry about, but some of the other people really, really do. We are trying our best, but please, please be patient with us here and there if the lines are a tiny bit longer than last year, if something is a bit chucky here and there. Patience, talk to us if there's something that really bugs you. If everything fails, I will personally go over the street and go to the Nespresso store and buy three more coffee machines. So if there's not enough coffee, we'll fix it, and hopefully lunch and everything else will work out as well. We have a bit of an issue. Last year, I blackmailed the Berlin organizers into organizing the dinner on the Reichstag, so on the German parliament building. They did that, but they only host 220 people up there. So we need to do a fairly precise headcount of those of you who plan to come tonight, 
and who planned to bring a spouse or something. We need it, since this is an official parliament building, it's on top of the German parliament. We need to submit names and birth dates, and you need to come and bring an ID tonight that has that same name and that birth date and a face that roughly resembles yours, right? It's, there is security control when you want to get in. Um, so what we are going to do is, everybody who has already sent a birth date, please still come to the registration desk and pick up a ticket so we get a precise headcount. And those of you who haven't submitted birth dates, we need those, A, for our data mining, but B, we need those, we need to submit them after lunch today at the very, very latest, otherwise you really, really won't get in. This is important, right? This is not something that we can, where we can bend the rules, that's something we need to send them, fax this over after lunch, okay? So it's going to be cramped, but hopefully it's going to be cozy and cozy good, and everybody enjoys having lots of people here. Um, where are people coming from? From all over the world. I know that people in Perth like to believe that they are the furthest away from everywhere else, but I still think that the guy from Sydney actually won for the longest trip. We have people from Japan, this time on the right spot. People from Africa, all over Europe, uh, all over, Europe over here, uh, from the West Coast and everywhere, so this is pretty cool. We were looking, since we have the data, we figured we might as well analyze it. We looked at the age distribution, so we can make sure over the years that we have enough young people growing into the nine user group. Um, everybody pretty much on the young side, uh, there's a bit of an outlier over there. That must be Phil and somebody else. Sorry, Phil, I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a special thanks, I did that last year, I wanted to do this year again, for people who keep coming back, mind-boggling as it may seem. Um, Taka, I yesterday found out he's actually not, he's not here today from Infocom, from Japan. He's actually not, not coming because he's scared, but he's not coming because he's expecting a baby. That's a good excuse. Um, Greg could have been an eight star today, but he got disqualified. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So the new star is Jean-Christophe from Schrödinger, who is here for the seventh time over there. <clears throat> And we have a couple of six stars, James Davison, I already saw him sitting here, Erdin Derity, we have Oliver Gutmann keeps coming back, he's back there, he refused to sit in the first row. Klaus-Peter Huber keeps coming back, personal friend of mine, that's nice to see him. And Niels Westcom keeps showing, you're driving the bus, right? Where is he? I saw you over there. You, you keep driving the bus all the way from Biberach with eight to nine people from Berlin, England. Very cool. And I was asked, uh, Mark wanted to be mentioned because he is here the fifth time, but sorry, that doesn't get your name up on the, on the slide. Good. A couple of highlights. This is about the, the summit with tons of people from all over the world, very different areas, some companies that we honestly never heard about, so this is really cool. A lot of people that we have never really met um, talk to us, grab one of the nine guys, they all wear, besides me, a badge that's very orange. Talk to us, let us know what you're doing with nine, how you're using it, how you're planning on using it. We're, we'd love to, love to learn more about that. Okay, what happened in 2015? 2015 was a pretty cool year for us. We, we grew, I mean, I, I keep joking that if you do anything in data that has data in the name, you can't not grow or not do better. I mean, you, you have to actively screw up things. So we grew. Um, one indicator of that is, is Gardner recognition. They keep doing these, these reports, these magic quadrants and advanced analytics platforms. It's kind of started 2010. That's the first time when we heard about Gardner when they named us Cool Vendor. And then in 2014, they released for the first time this magic quadrant report on advanced analytics platforms. And we instantly ended up, ed ended up in the upper right corner in the leader's quadrant. That was a nice surprise. In 2015, we moved up a bit. And uh, in 2016, the report was just released a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, I'm not allowed to show this to you because we, we refuse to pay Gardner any money. And so we're not allowed to distribute the report. But if you Google it, you will find it. I'll show it to you anyway. Um, 2016, we're up there. And one of the things I really like about this, assuming they used to have almost everybody somehow on the Pareto front that has stopped. And we are now leading everybody in terms of a completeness of vision. I thought that's actually pretty neat. Only Microsoft is ahead of us, but they have a problem executing, it seems, which is a bit strange. But anyway, so take it with a big grain of salt. But that's one way of recognizing that good things have happened at Nime. That was a positive surprise. We had long chats with Gardner, and they liked quite a number of things that we're doing. And I'll be talking about that a bit later as well. We have 
New Nimers, of course, tradition sort of introducing the new people that have joined NIM over the last year. The Berlin office is growing. Uh, Oleg Yasnev, very easy, lots, lots of the Nimers are back here. You'll meet them, look for the orange badges, joined us, he's working on a, on a lot of the website stuff. He's also doing a lot of the JavaScript development. That's pretty neat. Bjorn Lorman strengthened the, uh, over here, strengthened the big data team in Berlin. We recruited him out of one of the top universities here. In Zurich, Constance slash Heidelberg, we have John Fuller joined the life science team. Some of you have, may have already met him last uh, yesterday at the, the course. Heather Feisen is now officially working for NIME. I used to sort of borrow her from the university group, but she has joined NIME now part-time. Iris Ade switched over from the, you have met her last year when she was still with the University of Constance. She's now officially working for NIME. Um, and in case you're wondering how with that still very few people were doing all of this amazing stuff and if we still have fun and do worry about future NIME employees, we do. There are a couple of production babies that popped up. Popped up is a bad word for that. Anyway, they were born uh, last year, Lucy, Leo, Betty and Tobias. So the next generation of NIMERS is already there in the pipeline. Um, new in Constance, maybe also worth mentioning, we finally moved into a real office. This was one of the sunnier days. You can actually, if you look down out of these windows, you see the Rhine, it's on the fourth floor. If you ever are in Constance, please drop by. We also have coffee machine. We have one of these big American fridges with beer in the fridge, all this, so it's fun. And yes, it does look a bit more lively now. It looks like this now, we have a pool table. But they also, you can see back there, there are some monitors, so some people sometimes work when, when others play. Um, we are also working, this is not really a 2015 highlight, but it will be a 2016 highlight a few weeks after the summit. The Berlin gang is also going to move into a new office in one of these classic, beautiful Berlin buildings. I don't even know how to translate it, Hinterhof, uh, sort of a courtyard set up, very classic. So you come through here from the main street and then you go up four flights of stairs. Um, no elevator here, so if you want an elevator, come to Constance. So I'm not, still not quite sure how they're going to work this out in the fourth floor. Anyway, carrying up computers and the pool table. The pool table is going to be a nightmare. But anyway, so this is the building that should look soon a lot, lot nicer. There's one more peak in 2016 that I'm personally very proud of that it actually happened. Um, talking about the very first user group meeting, one person was there and we were all a bit scared of him because he came from a big company and we thought, oh, wow, they're interested in nine, scary. And then last year we started talking about him when he said, you know, I'd like to, is there maybe a job for me at nine? I'd like to do something new, something cool. And I said, yes, absolutely. So we started talking and I'm super proud to be able to announce that new in Zurich is Greg Landrum, who is now heading our life science business. Welcome, Greg. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> You have, to, you have too late, sorry. But th this is on the contract on page 35, the footprint. <laughs> so this is sort of what happened in 2015, what, uh, sort of on the, on the office, on the personal side. What did we do um, sort of on the technology, on the science side in 2015? And I was thinking about that a bit and I figured one way of describing our, where our focus is is maybe looking at what the analysts actually like about us. So you look at what one of the many actually fairly positive statements of Gardner in this magic quadrant is where they say almost every NIME customer mentions the platform's flexibility, openness and ease of integration with other tools. That seems to be something that differentiates us from the others. Not surprisingly, it's also very much in line with what we sort of promote as the strength of the open platform, flexibility, openness, ease of integration. So how do you sort of put this into context? And then I thought back and I said, well, let's put this into context of how people are supposed to work in a data mining and a data analytics and predictive analytics in a data science environment. And I reached back to the crisp DM cycle. Many of you probably know this. This is how data analytics, call it what you want these days, data science, it's still the same process. You need to somehow start with some sort of a business understanding, understand the data that you're gathering, this sort of goes back and forth, then you prepare the data, you model, build a model, you evaluate the model, you deploy the model, right? Usually when you talk about data science, what people get taught in classes is really only the right part where they say, oh, okay, mostly modeling, right? The rest is both easy. But without all of the other stuff, it's really fairly pointless. So I figured let's, let's try to map what Gardner likes onto this diagram and see where NIME and what we've been doing in NIME actually fits in. 
And you look at that first keyword as flexibility. What does that really mean, flexibility? And it has to do with a couple of these errors that are actually going the opposite direction. If it was all just one unidirectional flow from up here to down here, nobody cares about flexibility. You knew from the start what you wanted to do. You would write a program in whatever language you pleases. You compile it, you ship it, you'd be done, right? But that's not the case. So flexibility really has to do that data understanding will feed back to business understanding, that modeling will feed back to data preparation, and you realize wow, that's maybe not the model I should be applying to this type of data. Let's try something else. You want to be flexible. You want to quickly change things, supply other models. You don't want to necessarily be restricted to one particular vendor only. Now I died. <laughs> that bad? Now back, back online. You want to switch to another microphone? Yeah, please. Okay, thank cool. cool. Thank you. Okay, this works. Um, so flexibility. Uh, it's really about these green arrows feeding back, right? And then the biggest one, of course, also the evaluation. When, when you start evaluating your model, you realize, you know, that's not quite the question I meant to ask. You really need to be able to feed this back. And this is something, obviously, I mean, Gardner is actually now requiring for inclusion in this magic quadrant for advanced analytics platforms, they require what they call a visual composition framework. I think they searched for days for a name that didn't have pipeline or workflow of one of the names that one of the vendors is using or the tools is using to be, try to pretend to be neutral. But that's what we have, right? This is the ability to very quickly change things, try out things, makes it very, very flexible. So one thing we did in 2015, we sort of freshened up our UI a bit, made it a bit more modern. We used the opportunity when we had to change the underlying when we wanted to change the underlying Java and Eclipse anything, and also worked on the on UI refreshment a bit. Um, the other part, so that's flexibility. For me, this is really has to do with a visual framework that allows you to very quickly drop something else into your analysis flow, try out something else, and play with it, explore alternatives. The other part that they like is openness and ease of integration, and I think that's one of the things that truly differentiates us from a lot of the other visual composition framework providers. Um, because we are an open platform that really gives you a choice. We're not going to, NIME doesn't force you to say, I need to use an algorithm out of the NIME toolbox, but you can reach out to other stuff, right? This has much, a lot of this has to do being able to use different data sources, being able to use different ways of preparing your data. You're not restricted to do it all in Hadoop or all in Excel or all on your local client, but you can mix and match and also for the modeling parts. And then, of course, I mean, this diagram is a bit outdated, right? It assumes this data silo, one thing. You have many, many different data sources you want to mix and match there as well. Some of these data sources are sort of more data puddles, lakes, floods, swamps, I think Rosaya calls them now. So it's just a mess. On the data side, you also need to be able to have a lot of an open infrastructure so you can reach out and mix stuff. You don't have to upload all of your Excel data into Hadoop or pull down all of your Hadoop data on your desktop to be able to analyze it together. We do this. Last year, we already talked ex extensively about our R integration. We've had that for a while. Last year, we presented also a Python integration that allows you to reach out to a lot of these advanced analytics programming languages. We also worked a lot in 2015 adding more JavaScript components that allow you to reach out to a lot of these really cool interactive visualization libraries that are out there in the JavaScript community. Visual SQL for me is also one of these things, right? You don't need to be a SQL programmer to be able to assemble a SQL statement, a fairly complex even, fairly complex one even, using just a couple of our database nodes. A lot of this stuff we'll see in more depth in later sections and later talks. And then the thing that we invested a lot of time in, Bjorn and Tobias most notably, was of course the big data tool blending. So you can now also from within the NIME workflow, you can mix that with your Excel data, with your local data, with other normal classical databases. You can reach out to Hadoop, you can reach out to Spark, you can reach out to MLlib to train models on Hadoop. You can even mix those models with models that you trained locally. This is something we'll be talking about, well, I don't, but Tobias and Bjorn will be talking about later in the big data labs. This is for me part of the openness and the integration that you can actually mix and match all of these things together. And then, of course, one thing that Gardner sort of doesn't explicitly mention, but that's also very important, is the deployment. What do you do with the results, right? How do you actually use what you produced? And there's, of course, uh, we have partners here. If you want to deploy to machines, you need super high performant scoring of your models. We're partnering with Cementis. They have the ability to take a model and into, translate it into PMML from NIME, and then they score this super parallel, highly distributed. 
And for a lot of the classic visualization, uh, the classic deployment to business analysts tends to be visualizations, right? You're just exporting whatever you get from NIME, from your analytics tool, and you put that into a visualization environment and people can then, then slice and dice and try to understand what's going on. Again, one of our partners is here, Tipco with Spotfire particularly. They're nice integrations. We're also working with a couple others. But that's not really it, right? What Gardner really talks about, how do you deploy not the model, not the visualizations, but how do you deploy the analytics that they're actually doing? Is there a way for the data science to be used by others who aren't necessarily data scientists? Right? How do you deploy analytics to business analysts? One of the things that was sort of in the, oh, was all the hype maybe a year ago was analytics for the masses, right? Everybody needs to be able to use this somehow. Um, in a way, step one, the, the vision went a bit like that. You, have, you start, you have a data scientist who follows the entire process, builds something amazingly cool, puts it into a black box, and then I throw the data into the black box and the answer comes out. Right? That's impossible. Right? Especially, I mean, for very, very narrow problem scenarios, this may be possible if the analysis goal is essentially really well defined. But that's not really advanced analytics. Advanced analytics is when you want to explore the data. And sort of the analytics process itself starts triggering new questions. That's not something a black box can or will be able to do. So what people then started talking about, well, probably, I mean, this sort of analytics for the masses looks a bit like that, right? You have on the one side, you have the data scientist sitting there, hammering through the process, doing amazingly cool stuff. He ships the black box to the business analytics consumer. And the analytics consumer looks at it and says, what? Doesn't really help. So then people started talking about data citizens. That's also a term that pops up in the Gartner report, where you kind of have this assumption that the analytics consumer is somehow, without really being a data scientist, empowered to follow that process anyway, right? So you have the analytics consumer, and we just we call him data citizen out of the sudden, and suddenly he actually knows how to do that. He doesn't really need a data scientist anymore. The data scientist just maybe wrote cool programs, but then he's job without a job. And then he starts running through all of that stuff, the person here, the, our data citizen. But he doesn't really know what's going on, right? So he's reading a couple of these books, Data Science for Dummies, and figures, I'm going to apply a decision. What was that? Something, right? And then he trains that, and weird things happen. So he just says, well, and then somewhere in the middle there, the interesting part, black magic, right? That's not really going to work either, because there's a lot of decisions that you're making on the data. I mean, probably everybody here in the room knows that. There's a lot of decisions that you're making in the data science process, in the modeling, and the data preparation process that dramatically affect the outcome of what we are doing. So somehow, that's not working either. So the guy probably is still pretty puzzled. So what you really like to do is, of course, I mean, the goal underneath the hood is you really want your analytics consumer to really work together with the data scientists. Because the, analytics, the, the nice thing about the CRISP process, I realize, is actually it does split fairly nicely into two parts. You have the person that does have the business understanding, that's this guy. You have the deployment that this one really worries about. And then over here, the data understanding, data preparation modeling, she knows. But you, the problem is we don't have enough data scientists, so we somehow need to fill that bridge with some automated way. So what we are, and the idea is, of course, that this, this guy then has actually interesting insights. So what we are proposing is guided analytics. This is sort of what we've been pushing for for the last year, and this seems to be working very nicely. We have a couple of early use cases and mm, customers and users actually starting to use this, where we put sort of the NIME web portal in the middle. The NIME web portal, sort of our server infrastructure with the, the web front end, allows you to essentially have the data scientist upload a fairly complex workflow and deploy that workflow to the other side, to an analytics consumer, in a more or less interactive way, right? The, the dumbest users only get the click here and there's your report. The slightly more sophisticated users, we may be able to say, hey, you know, give me some information about the data set. Let me guide a bit what we're doing. That's really the goal, right? So the data scientists allows, through that workflow, we can actually not only upload and define an analytics procedure, a visual composed framework, but a workflow, but we can do this, we can define carefully selected interaction points and essentially say for this type of analysis, I do need to know what the data looks like, I need to know this type of information, I can gather this type of feedback, right? Then you display some of these explanations to your analytics consumer and allow through these carefully designed interaction points to actually allow some feedback, 
And that finally allows you to actually incorporate some of the user feedback into the analytics procedure and still use the wisdom of the person here that assembled the workflow in the first place, right? So suddenly we don't necessarily, this is a bit like what you would do anyway, right? In many cases, if I'm just uploading a workflow without inter any interaction points, my business analysts, they will keep calling me, right? And they will say, well, Almost, but I had a slightly different question, right? So I have two choices there. I can either keep uploading new and slightly modified workflows, and I can say, you know what? These types of questions are really starting to bug me. So I'm going to define a slightly more gener generic workflow that actually allows these interaction points to be adjusted by my end user, right? Um, so in a nutshell, the data scientist designs workflows with interaction points, and they provide sufficient flexibility to incorporate the user feedback that we need, the user focus, the analysis focus. And then the analytics consumer is, is faced with a more or less easy UI. It really depends on the qualifications of the user. Upper management may really only get the one button. More smarter people that can deal with technology, they may get a few more buttons, choices, right, that we can actually in incorporate into our stuff, which has the appropriate abstraction level for his, her level of expertise and hides unnecessary or unwanted or just plain confusing complexity. In a way, this is interesting because it actually adds two feedback loops indirectly, however, right? It's something that the analyst really, the data scientist really needs to build into the workflow, but it allows us to get business understanding, query explicitly for some pieces of business understanding and feed that into the data preparation and the data modeling phase, right? Now you're all sitting there and saying, this is very high level, blah, blah, this is never going to work. Absolutely true, so you have to wait a bit until the end of today's session when Rosaria and Phil actually showing a guided analytics and action tour. So I'm really only the teaser for the talk by, by Phil and Rosaria. They'll be talking more about guided analytics and action and how this actually works in a real life scenario use case using the Nine web portal. Okay, what are we, three slides just on what we will be focusing on in the, in the next year and probably also beyond some of those projects are a little bit longer term. And in order to do that, I wanted to just look a bit at where is analytics actually going. When I do that, I usually look at three different areas, right? You, have, you sort of have different types of data. You have different tools that people are using that they need to be using, or sometimes they're just fashionable to be used. And you have the types of users that you're trying to serve, right? On the data side, right, yesterday's stuff was small, structured, easy stuff. Now we're talking about big data, machine-generated data, very heterogeneous data. And well, many of the talks here today and tomorrow are essentially talking about problems like that. Then on the tool side, we went from statistics, classical machine learning, now we call it data mining. A lot of the methods really are the same. Deep learning currently is all the hype. Talk to me about deep learning after I had a beer and I'll give you my honest opinion. Um, I th there's some true, it's a bit disappointing, right? I used to do neural networks 20 years, 25 years ago and it's still exactly the same technology. The only thing they do is they have more, massively more compute power. It's not really very satisfying progress, right? You just throw more compute power at it. But anyway, and then on the user side, right, it was super highly specialized people. Now we're talking about data science business analysts. And analytics is really all about discovering insights, predicting futures, right? This is what you really want to do with all of the data, and you want to somehow deploy that to your users. Where's this going? We don't really know, right? On the tomorrow, what's data going to look like? It's going to be much more fluent. Very likely, it's going to be too much to store. No matter what we do, in my opinion, this approach of Hadoop, we destroy everything that's coming in. Even that one is doomed, right? And physics, people in physics know how to do that. CERN has been trashing 99% of the data they see the moment they see it, right? They know how to trash data. So we need to be a lot better about that one. Interactive, adaptive, tools, right? The ability to write learning algorithms that actually incorporate user feedback. Guided analytics, the same idea, right? How do I actually take what a user is interested in and put and make that part of the modeling process? And then on the data user side, we already talked about that data citizens call it what you want, but this guided analytics theme, how do I actually incorporate user feedback into an analytical process? How can we do that? So if you really Look at analytics, it's really about discovering insights, predicting futures with, we don't really know, right? With yet to be invented tools, yet to be collected data, and then we really, really, really want to give our business analysts access to data science. Not just visualizations, not just reports, not just predictive models, but the ability to actually play with the science underneath it all. Can we do that? 
So these three categories, if you look at that, what are we working on? Then the yet-to-be-invented tools, I mean, it's about the integrations, right? I mean, we're building our own tools. I mean, you'll see this later in the What's Cooking session. We are working on a deep learning framework, integrating an existing framework into NIME, integrating cool tools that are out there. We're never, NIME is never going to be a platform that has everything. There's maybe besides R, which in principle has everything, but half of it is not really usable. Right? NIME will never be able to do that, so instead we will continue to focus on integrating with cool state-of-the-art technology that's out there. One of those is, of course, this big data wild west that we're, seems to be starting to consolidate a bit. Talked to Tobias and Bjorn a bit about that, they had a really hard time. Right now, Spark APIs and the underlying data structures changing every two months makes those types of integrations a lot harder. But that seems to be consolidating. We've been, they have been working hard to make that a lot better, and they'll be keeping, keep working hard on that one. And then, of course, this idea of blending data, different data sources, different tools. Talk to us if you have something that you'd really like to use. Maybe it's something that others want to use as well, and we'll integrate that a bit sooner. Yet to be collected data that will simply just about continue our push into the cloud. We already have a server installation in the cloud that you can get from us. Uh, we are that close to announcing an analytics platform in the Microsoft Azure cloud, and we will keep working on that front massively this year. And then, of course, the giving business analysts access to data science has about, well, we need to continue to improve the interactions that we allow the data scientists to put into his or her workflows so they can deploy these interaction points to the users. Again, we're very, very interested in your feedback, right? We're working with a pharma company and one other company in the, in the retail space on use cases where we're sort of defining what kind of interaction points we need, but there are many others out there that could be interesting. And that gives you the added flexibility for guided analytics workflows. So this sort of has a little glimpse into the future. One other thing, the sentence, this paragraph actually continues and then says, NIME continues to receive among the highest customer satisfaction ratings. And this is thanks to you all, right? Many of you here were called by Gardner or filled out a very extensive Gardner survey. Thank you very much. And obviously, you are all finding only positive words, much, much appreciated. And we are, this is actually my highest priority, and I know it's a very high priority for everybody in I'm We want to keep that sentence in there. I don't care almost about anything else, but we want high customer and user satisfaction. Gardner, unfortunately, doesn't really differentiate between open source users and customers. For us, this is really all the same. Our users are supposed to be happy. Good. Um, so, one little peek into the very near-term future, what's going to happen in the next two and a half days. We have the summit agenda, we made a few minor changes. We did drop the partner section, um, not because the partner section wasn't cool, but it tends to be super specialized. So, for every partner presentation, and we have just too many, there's only a small fraction of the audience usually interested in that presentation. So, we decided I'm going to briefly introduce all of the partners that are here and actually have a demo booth back there instead of putting an entire section into the agenda. And we also streamlined the poster presentations a bit more, make them shorter. Phil is going to use his management skills, no, his, his presentation skills, I don't know, his entertainment skills, I think is the right word, um, to introduce the posters very quickly and yet you know what it's all about so you know and you know where to find them. Okay, um, this is almost over. Uh, this will be followed by what's new in NIME session, the usual one. Berndt is going to chair that one. We have a special session in there. I'll say a bit more when I introduce the speaker, why we had to squeeze it into this slot. But Ralf, I don't know if you, if you already arrived today. Excellent. Thank you very much for making it possible and jumping in. Um, then we'll continue after that, after lunch, with the what's cooking in NIME session. And we decided to carve out the big data part into an explicit and extra session, because there's a lot of stuff that happened last year that's worth talking about. And a lot of that stuff is actually done in very close collaboration with Siemens, who have also sponsored some of that development. Thank you very much, Siemens. And uh, that's why we figured we'll ask Jan to talk a bit about that together with Tobias, how they're actually using NIME in the big data setup at, uh, at Siemens. Um, we have a great talk by Benjamin Spiegel on customer data analytics. Uh, we came all the way from Houston. Thanks, Benjamin. And then we'll have this talk by Rosari and Phil that I already mentioned. End of 
day one will be at 5. And then, as I said, um, the dinner starts at 7.30. You can go up there earlier, right? I mean, the, I don't know who here has already been on the Reichstag. It's a beautiful building with a cupola, a glass dome designed by Sir Roman Foster. We can actually look down onto the parliament itself. It's a beautiful sightseeing spot. And one corner of the deck essentially hosts the cafe restaurant where we're going to have the dinner. So come a bit earlier, take in the sights, take some pictures. And as far as I know, the weather is supposed to be nice which at this time of the year means it's not raining, right? I mean, don't, don't ask too much of German weather, but it should be cool. Um, then the next morning, we're going to start with a life science session, a couple of interesting talks, uh, followed by a few neat talks about health monitoring. Dominique came all the way from the Valise band and his good wine to come here. Um, this is kind of neat little talk about using NIME to sort of test web pages. I thought that was cool. And this is the, the talk by Brian, will, is sort of our master of NIME presentation, which I thought was a really cool way of tweaking NIME around, dockerizing uh, uh, NIME for, well, recipes for a NIME cocktail. You'll see, you'll hear it when you're here. You'll see it when you hear it. So the demos, I, sh I promise to quickly introduce the partners that are here. We have a couple of life science partners here. Schrödinger always comes first on these lists, not alphabetically, but because they are our first partner, right? They signed up in 2006. They're still around. They're around the corner there, Jean-Christophe, number seven. Um, Cam Axon and Infocom have a desk here as well. They have a really nice life science integration. Infocom, Azura from Infocom is here. They are doing actually the NIME wrappers around the JCAM tools from Cam Axon. Cresset is also here, I think also over here, uh, also providing insights, demos about their NIME integrations. We have other cool technology as well. I already mentioned Zementis. They do very cool PMML scoring engines. There's also going to be talk on Thursday by Bosch that are using Lime and Zementis in, in concert. Actian is here, also a longtime partner. They have a really cool demo about integrating their super fast data flow engine into Lime, so that actually allows you to streaming, screaming fast data processing and learning. Tipco Spotfire already mentioned with their visualization integration. It's actually something done by Informatics. Um, Datatronic, a new partner of ours, doing IoT, sensor, cool stuff. They actually, they have real hardware. So if you want to touch stuff and not only talk about software, that's probably the booth to talk, go to. And then on the consulting side, three of our partners are here. Dimetrics, longtime partner, doing a lot of work in custom intelligence. Informatics, uh, also doing a lot of integration work. They have also helped us with a lot of the work at, on Siemens and some of the other customers. And they are also responsible for a lot of the TIPCO Spotify integration. And then finally, Software AG is joining Zementis at their desk as well, a newer nine partner. Good, and then Thursday continues with an afternoon session, a couple of cool talks. I already mentioned this one from, from Bosch that's going to talk about how Zementis and Nine play very nicely together. We have a short break then, and then we managed to bring him back. Yeah, I'm very happy about that. Dean actually, I'm not sure he volunteered. I think we just told him you have to come back after last year's summit. And he said, okay, but he's back. Um, Thanks, Dean, for, for traveling all the way from San Diego. He's going to talk about, actually, I told him, Dean, you can talk about whatever you want. We are going to enjoy it, no matter what you talk about. He said, OK, I'll talk about target shuffling. He said, great. So he's going to be talking about measuring variable importance with target shuffling. And if you, if you have no idea what this means, you'll know it afterwards, and you'll enjoy learning it. Um, there's one typo. There's always a typo in every agenda. This one doesn't really matter, but you probably already wondered, is he really only speaking for 15 minutes? And even worse, do we really have to wait half an hour not doing anything for the beer to arrive? No. This is, should be 5.30, of course. Dean has 45 minutes to, uh, to talk about variable importance, and then we'll go straight to the Nime Lounge and beer tasting. This is going to be here. We're going to have finger food, typical Berlin finger food. And, and the local brewery is actually bringing some of their beer. And then on Friday, the usual workshops. You know this. We have two sessions. You know the game here. Uh, a morning session from 9 to 10.30, from 11 to 12.30, two and the division. You see this in the program. We have a couple of different workshops. If you haven't signed up for workshops yet, please see the registration desk and talk to them which ones you want to. So we can, if one is overflowing, we can swap room, rooms maybe on, on last notice. So check the, the beamer in the morning when you come here, the projector here for the program, which room your workshop really is in. And I think this is all from my side. Rosaria and Frank have asked me to ask you to tweet, tweet, tweet. If you have something interesting to say or pictures to post, tweet about NIME Summit 2016 or data science mentioned Berlin, big data. 
whatever tweet about us. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy it and have fun. Thank you.